hello everybody. Um, it's the first webinar in this series, which we'll introduce uh, in a few seconds. I just want to thank Elixir. I want to thank David in particular for organizing all of this. Uh, it's a second series um, of webinars related to SARS-CoV-2 in the past what, six months. And uh, today we are going to talk about two things. We are essentially going to introduce the um, the series and we're going to talk about some challenges related to uh, data analysis for COVID-19 and for SARS-CoV-2. So COVID-19 is probably incorrect uh, label here. It's really SARS-CoV-2 that we're dealing with. And um, it's going to be presented by Marius van den Beek and uh, myself. So I'm going to start. I'm just putting this, uh, usually it's not a good idea to put slides with a lot of text, but this is a quote from the paper which we published earlier this year. It's, uh, it's, it's, it was written by Andrew Loney from Australia. And I just wanna read that. And, um, you know, in an age of digital connectedness, open, highly accessible, globally shared data and analysis platforms have the potential to transform the way biomedical research is done opening the way to global research markets where competition arises from uh, deriving understanding rather than access to samples and data. Other disciplines have embraced benefits of global data generation and sharing. Astronomy and high energy physics are two examples. We have the opportunity to mirror their success in infrastructure funding by demonstrating that global research can be can embrace the same global perspective on common infrastructure investment and data sharing. Because there's a difference between infrastructure for physics and biology. Physics infrastructure tends to be unified, you know, big things like colliders. In biology, it's slightly, slightly more distributed. But the point here is that global health emergencies require global response. And that means sharing data, tools, and computational resources. And this is what we use galaxy.star as a project are trying to do. So uh, this is the first webinar in the series. We are going to have five more and it's gonna cover a variety of subjects uh, such as infrastructure, uh, COVID portal, uh, re things related to um, understanding intra-host variability from raw data, uh, analysis of selection, uh, also uh, resources like Viral Beacon and Galaxy Partnership, and also it's going to end with an um, interesting um, aspect of um, with uh, direct RNA sequencing of SARS-CoV-2. This is a new technology and it provides interesting insights into SARS-CoV-2 transcriptome architecture, RNA modifications, things like that. So um, SARS-CoV-2 is interesting because it is, I guess I can say with uh, high confidence, it's probably the most sequenced organism to date. Um, and the reason for that is that this is the first pandemic which really coincides with proliferation of sequencing technologies. Uh, sequencing is, is not something uh, only selected centers can do now, it's widespread, and therefore we have just enormous amounts of sequences. And I try to separate challenges that we see into two groups, into technical challenges and into biological challenges. Although you will see that they're, they're a little over, there's a little overlap from that. So the first challenge is of course, it's the data is enormous. Uh, the I don't know what G8 probably as of today has something like 400,000 complete genomes, and uh, sequence read archives that includes one at NCBI and one at ENA uh, over. So it's getting close to about 200,000 uh, sequencing data sets by now. So even these portals, such as the one at NCBI and ENA. They, they have difficulty with it. It's actually hard to retrieve these data. Uh, there is heterogeneity of analysis practices. There are probably tens of thousands of publications now. Many of these publications do the same thing, but they do it in a variety of ways. And some of these ways are very good. And some of these ways don't make any sense. So there is really no good um, 
good common, there is no good, good common set of workflows for doing common things. With one exception, perhaps, I think UK is the, is the only country which really has the pipeline for doing these things in a very systematic way. And I'm talking about uh, ampliconic sequencing of SARS-CoV-2 from patients. And another problem is that there is a widening technological divide between you know, US, EU, developed countries and the rest of the world. Pandemic has no borders. It affects uh, developed countries as much as uh, it, it, it affects developing world. And when we publish things, uh, when we even publish good workflows and provide you know, some workflow files and tell people, well, here's my workflow file, just go and run it. Uh, but if you're a researcher somewhere in Ukraine, for example, I'm from Ukraine, so there are no resources of any kind, how exactly are you gonna run it? Well, it's very nice that you provided your widow files to run it on Google Cloud, but I have absolutely no way to pay for it. So we need to share data, we need open tools, but we also need an infrastructure to run these open tools on because tools make no difference if you cannot use them. Some of the biological challenges, um, you will see that there is this discrepancy and we talked about this at the previous webinar as well. There are 400,000 complete genomes, yet there are only about 200,000 read data sets. Where's the rest? How do you verify assemblies? Suppose you get something from GZ, which has some weird rearrangement. How do you know it's not an assembly artifact? We need primary data. And in, in reality, we have primary data for a small subset of things at the moment. Um, there is very little known about intra-host variation. What happens in a particular patient during the infection? There are very few temporal data sets, which, uh, for example, follow a single patient. And in general, it's, it's the side of the SARS-CoV-2 variation story, which, is, which gets much less attention than variation at population level and differences between individual uh, assembled genomes from individual patients. And there's also a need for data integration because there are tens of thousands of papers. Some of these papers focus on genomics. Some of these papers focus on evolution. Some of them focus on transcriptomics, on proteomics, on chemoinformatics. So there are different kinds of data sets and we need to be able to integrate data. And the examples that I have here, so I have, for example, intra-host variants. Do they overlap with sites under selection? There is also a, a large set of synonymous substitutions in SARS-CoV-2, those that don't change underlying amino acids. Do they affect transcriptome structure, for example? Do they affect uh, secondary RNA structures which are involved in, the pro uh, in, in processing and maturation of um, subgenomic RNAs, for example, in SARS-CoV-2? So to answer that question, we need to be able to integrate data, access it in all sorts of creative ways. So these are some of the challenges that uh, philosophical challenges that we see. And we published a manuscript uh, last year which uh, expands on, on some of them. And in fact, that quote that I mentioned in the beginning, it, uh, it, it is from this manuscript. But um, it's interesting that publishing in SARS-CoV-2 is, um, things are changing so rapidly that a normal processing cycle with you submit the manuscript and you know half a year later, you maybe get the reviews doesn't really work very well here. And this is why uh, there are these good resources such as, for example, virological.org where a lot of um, latest information uh, is, um, is available. So what are we trying to do uh, as in, in particular, this is, I, I kind of represent, so me and Marius, we represent more of a genomic side of galaxy effort. So. Uh, but there are also proteomic sides of the galaxy effort, chemoinformatic sides of galaxy effort, uh, evolutionary aspects uh, in, in galaxy and so on. So from the genomic standpoint, what we want to do is we want to develop uh, best practices. Well, we're not really an authority that we can develop best practices, but we're a community. So we can create workflows which are 
shared. Everything we create, uh, we create is shared. So the community can modify them. You know, all these things can be versioned. And so hopefully we will come up with the best practices. And I, I think we're pr providing initial seed set of workflows. And this works, workflows will include assembly workflows, in particular from Illumina, uh, Oxford Nanopore data, and latest PEGBio uh, types of um, data. Uh, variant calling is one of the things that's kind of a dear to me in particular. Um, in case of SARS-CoV-2, there are two sources of data for which you can uh, which you can analyze for genetic variation. This is with data sets which are produced directly from RNA, so RNA-seq types of data sets, and ampliconic data, which is much more uh, widespread, such as, for example, COG UK data is uh, almost exclusively uh, ampliconic. Uh, there is also these new ways, uh, new types of data, such as direct RNA sequencing data, which is very interesting for SARS-CoV-2. It's an RNA virus after all. And from that, um, uh, we can do RNA modifications and so on. So uh, the workflows that we are producing, I'm just gonna show you some screenshots. Well, these are complex workflows for example, uh, detection of variants from RNA-seq data, assembly workflow. This is assembly workflow specifically for a uh, hybrid situation where you have short and long reads, and it uses, uh, in this case, spades and unicycler. Well, unicycler is kind of a mega wrapper on top of spades, but that workflow allows you to compare things. Uh, the Workflows for ampliconic, uh, ampliconic analysis from Illumina data, ampliconic analysis from Oxford Nanopore data. We're trying to develop workflows which work on the primary Oxford Nanopore data. So not on FASTQ files, but on actual FAST5 files, which contain much more information. And when we talk about uh, direct RNA sequencing, uh, there are, there's a number of workflows which were developed by Freiburg uh, group, which include read mapping, read mapping, read classification, junction analysis. If you remember molecular biology of SARS-CoV-2, there's this, there's a, there's a genome, but there are also subgenomic. There's a, a positive strand, negative strand, which um, appears through, uh, during the, uh, during replication. There are also subgenomic RNAs so there's a lot of things to make sense of from direct RNA sequencing data and also workflows for detecting modifications using Nanocompore and uh, Tomb at the moment. And this is, uh, there's a preprint by uh, Milad Miladi. I think this is the first version which was done by uh, Freiburg Group. <laughs> and <clears throat> this is an example of four samples in which we are trying to, uh, well, Milad really is trying to um, find RNA modifications and this is Oxford Nanopore squiggles. Also, uh, there is a number of evolutionary analysis. This is collaboration between Galaxy team and Data Monkey Hi-Fi group. Uh, and this group is um, has been developing tools for analysis of selection for uh, good part of the last decade. And our goal here is to allow people to, uh, if you take a set of complete genomes, you can uh, analyze this data to identify sites under different selective regimes. And I'm talking about positive and negative selection, different types of positive selections and uh, selection as well as uh, recombination. And uh, this data uh, generates a um, dashboard. This is a screenshot of this dashboard, but in fact, it's a live dashboard. It's kind of a live code where you can uh, look at individual sites, track them, th track them through time. And uh, this is kind of our answer to this uh, idea of that uh, SARS-CoV-2 data needs a good way to integrate different types of data. So uh, uh, we we will approach that through these notebook-like environment. In this case, uh, this is using uh, observable HD, HQ. Um, and at this point, I am going to give the podium to Marius. Thank you, Anton.
Okay. You can do the slides. All right. So I will be flipping. Just tell me when. Um, yeah, no. <laughs> cool. Uh, so, yeah, um, one of the issues uh, that we encountered is that there are both metadata issues and data access uh, issues. And these have improved over time as the pandemic progressed and more um, data sets came in. Um, however, there are still some problems when it comes to really fully automatizing uh, an analysis and to draw meaningful uh, conclusions from it. Um, so for instance, for Ampliconic workflows, you really need to know uh, which primer set has been used, um, whether your data set is a single and or paired end data set. Um, and also the uh, two major sites, the ENA and the SRA, uh, do not have exactly the same data sets. Um, they are supposed to, and I presume due to the sheer amount of data, this is why they're not in sync, but they are currently not entirely in sync. So some of the ENA data is not available at the SRA. Um, I mentioned already that paired end data is occasionally not fully available or uh, is available only through um, uh, the cloud service of the SRA, which is uh, a bit of an accessibility problem. Um, and then also, yeah, I mean, some of these things are clearly wrong. Like if you look at the collection by date, um, it generally makes sense. So you can see actually the first uh, peak of cases and you can see the second peak of cases. Um, you can also see that so this data is collected yesterday, but it drops off at the collection date of the newest data sets coming from December. Uh, so that as well is a little problematic. Um, and you can see some of these things are clearly wrong. I mean, there are some samples collected in uh, 1992 um, and a huge swath that just has a random date, which is the 4th of January. Um, so uh, these, these remain challenges. Can you do the next slide? Okay, um, so- if I, if I may, I just want to, uh, so on the previous slide, I would like to emphasize one thing is that for whoever's listening to this webinar, if you, or your students deposit data into SRA or ENA, please pay attention to metadata fields. It's important. If you want your data to be useful for others, we need to know which Arctic version primers you used. What is the location? How you prepared the library? All this information is essential to make this data useful for others. And ultimately, it's a global health problem. It, it requires unified solutions. So make your data accessible to others. Sorry, yeah. I was, sorry, Marius. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so um, as you've seen, we've, uh, and when I say we, I mean the global Galaxy community has developed uh, a number of workflows. And of course they've been developed by multiple people collaborating on the same workflow. And this is something that Galaxy uh, was good at. Um, and it's of course still good at, and we're trying to get better about it. Uh, but there were some, some shortcomings, some, some pitfalls when it comes to exchanging workflows. Um, and don't get me wrong, you could already for years exchange workflows and they contain all the versions of the tools used, um, really everything down to the last detail to reproduce. However, um, you would need to publish the workflow on the Galaxy instance. And then if you wanted to use it, you needed to download it from the Galaxy instance and then uh, upload it back to another Galaxy instance. So for instance, if you are a usegalaxy EU user, you want to use the workflow from usegalaxy.org, you would have to go to usegalaxy.org in the published workflows, find the workflow you want and then upload it. Um, so that, that's not the most straightforward way. Um, also the interface does not provide as much metadata as one could provide. We are in the year 2021. Um, this should be better. Um, also, if you just publish a workflow on a Galaxy instance, we assume it works for you, but there are no tests included. Um, so there's no way to verify, does the workflow actually um, produce correct results? Does, does it work as advertised? Um, there are no official versions. So Galaxy workflows are versioned and 
we know, of course, uh, which data sets have been produced by which workflow at which version. Um, however, these are not official versions, right? So when you use a software, we all know this, there's version one, version 1.1, version 1.2. Um, there may be a major change and now it is version two, version three. Um, so these are best practices in the software world that are established for quite some time. Um, and Galaxy has versions, but they are just, you know, previous version, next version, uh, when has it been created? And all these things are just local to, to one particular Galaxy server. And in the same way, we didn't really have a change log. You could, of course, um, in the metadata fields of your workflow, you could say, this is what is new and update that every time. But in practice, that's not something uh, we really did. And we need to do better. Next slide. So there are, of course, places uh, that specialize in this. So two of the recent examples are uh, Workflow Hub um, that's funded by um, the EU. And there's also uh, DocStore that's the equivalent in the US. And they both have fantastic support for uh, workflows, not just Galaxy workflows, also CWL, Riddle, Cromwell. So, you know, for all your workflow needs, you, you can go there and discover workflows. Um, and this is something we, we really embraced. So you can see here two examples of uh, SARS-CoV-2 Galaxy workflows um, and how they are at these um, workflow repositories. Uh, these workflow repositories use a common standard, a GA4GH TRS um, standard, and Galaxy is now compatible with this standard. So uh, you can easily import a workflow that comes from such a repository. And in addition, you get, uh, you get actual versions. So um, it's a bit small in the screenshot, but you see that um, you can select a version, you can preview the uh, graph of the workflow, you can see the tools that are included. Um, and in the future, you will even be able to directly launch the workflow from these interfaces. Next slide. Um, so there is a Galaxy interface for uh, importing these workflows. And as I mentioned, you can select which version you actually want to use. Uh, next slide. And so there is one additional thing that um, is part of, you know, making workflows really production ready, which is that you do go from the Galaxy server. So a, a workflow developer develops a workflow. Um, and then they can uh, publish that workflow on GitHub or any other um, uh, code repository. And from there, you can push. So there you can run tests. You can have uh, reviews. So we are working on uh, establishing really a workflow community as we have a community for tools um, where really the expertise is there, where people can look at the workflow and see, hey, that parameter makes sense, or maybe you could rearrange this a little bit to make it faster, or there's a step missing here, or um, similar concerns, or there, there might be a better tool available. Um, so all these things can happen at uh, on, on GitHub. And so we are setting up a central repository, the IWC, Intergalactic Workflow Commission repository. And from there, we create individual smaller repositories um, where we can create real releases with version numbers, with a change log. And from there, we can also automatically distribute the workflows to any TRS uh, server. Um, so really, these workflow hubs are great and we can use them interchangeably and we can publish uh, to all of them. And this will really make it much easier. So we can go beyond just publishing a workflow on a Galaxy instance, but publish them to a central place um, and avoid exchanging uh, workflow files by email um, and really have a strong reference that we can also use um, to publish the links, um, to create DOIs um, and so on. Next slide. Um, and then another thing that we realized during this pandemic is that I mean, we, we really work on workflows. Workflows were really a central uh, thing. And Galaxy has a lot of workflow features but there's also many ways to do things in Galaxy. And there's of course many ways to design a workflow, but there are certain things, certain practices that are better than others. Um, so the team has developed um, a new panel in the workflow editor that can automatically tell you, 
hey, this, this is maybe not the best way to do it. Um, if you really want to make a good workflow, you can do this. Um, there is an explanation of what, um, what is you know, the best thing that you can do. And if possible, uh, you can also automatically fix that. So you just click a button and it will do the right thing, ideally. Um, another thing that is uh, very, very useful in Galaxy is you can have uh, sub workflows uh, or embedded workflows. So you can have a workflow that does maybe one specific thing like quality control or mapping or aligning or um, just reshaping a column in, in a tabular file. And these small pieces, they're reusable uh, because you can include them in another workflow. So one thing that th this already worked for many years, but um, you would have to then go and update the workflow you included and then update them in all the other workflows that included that workflow. Um, and that wasn't super straightforward, but we, we did make this easier now. So there are no two buttons where um, you can either directly upgrade to the latest version of a workflow that you include in this workflow, or you can um, edit the workflow at that version and then come back and update it. Um, so that, that's a, uh, hopefully a big uh, improvement. Uh, next slide. Um, another thing that is becoming more important is licenses. So um, like digital works without the license are basically not usable. Um, you always, you, you do need to include a license. So this is also now integrated in the Galaxy Workflow Editor. Uh, you can choose a license. And in the same way, it's also important to know who created this workflow, right? Where does the credit go? Um, so this can be either a person or a, um, an organization. Uh, you can add things like a homepage. You can add your ORCID identifier. Um, there is a, a um, large amount of attributes that you can add. And all of this is uh, backed by official schemas. Um, and this will, of course, also be displayed uh, within Galaxy and within the workflow registries. Uh, next slide. Um, and so another thing that, like, became very apparent is that um, for certain parts of Galaxy, certain things, certain operations, uh, we're getting slow when you reach a threshold of a thousand or more uh, data sets. Um, so we, the way to, to really work with these large data sets is using data sets collections. So on the left, there is an example of a collection that has uh, 4,000 items. And of course, you know, you start with your FASTQ files, you do the mapping, uh, you do the variant calling and so on. You do maybe 20, 30, 40 steps in a workflow, each one creating 4,000 uh, data sets within a collection. So that all keeps it nicely organized and you can browse through it, find what you want to find um, with relative ease. Um, however, there are some operations when you're in a collection um, that used to be done for each element in the collection while well, that could actually be done just once for the entire collection. So uh, collection have this huge potential, like um, access and permission checking can be reduced to a collection. So you just do that once instead of uh, n times for n data sets in the collection. But we had to implement that, um, and, and we did. Um, and there were many cases where we had like a little bit of a recursive behavior unintentionally in the code. So we went ahead and looked at all of this carefully. And um, we are currently at the state where it doesn't matter how big the collection is, it's going to be around 60 milliseconds uh, to um, create an actual job. Uh, and you have to <clears throat> take into account, like these are a lot of data sets, but they also take some time to execute. So uh, the time that's going to be spent executing is really the time that the cluster um, requires to, to do the actual computation. It's not Galaxy that is the bottleneck. Um, next slide. Um, yeah, and so another thing when you rely heavily on workflows and especially if the workflows are big, um, it used to be a bit complicated to understand what is your workflow actually doing and like, what, is anything really happening? Um, so we have a new uh, workflow detail component. So once you run a workflow, this opens automatically, but you can also go into the invocations menu and see your old workflow executions. And this is a reactive component. It also uses um, modern view components. It uses the uh, components 
that um, are also part of the new history panel that will be in the upcoming uh, Galaxy release. Um, and so you can see really um, the parameters that were used in a workflow. Uh, so what, has, what were the settings that were used? You can see the um, inputs. So all the inputs that your workflow consumed, you can open them They are. Um, you can click on them there like your history. You can see each individual detail. You can rename things, you can delete things, you can tag them. Um, and then you see, so that, that's on the left side. And on the right side, um, this is just a bit further down, you have the individual steps. Um, so it used to be that you could see like, okay, there's this many jobs executed and there we're at this uh, step. But of course, that's not really how it works because um, Galaxy will start processing uh, jobs once the inputs are ready. So it might be executing multiple steps at the same time. And it might be a bit confusing, like what, what, what is actually going on? So now you can go and look at the steps of your workflow and you can see also all the inputs of a step. And if the input is not ready, it will tell you, well, the input's not ready, we're waiting on this step. Um, there's the same time the, the outputs. So the outputs are also reactive. You see um, once you know, the job starts running, you see, okay, the job started running. Uh, when it completes, it completes. Um, and you can also browse through there easily. So say you have like a collection, you created 4,000 jobs at this step. So you can see, okay, there are 4,000 jobs and maybe one or two are in error. And then you can find the ones that are in error. You can click on the job, it expands. It shows you all the information. It shows you the command line. It shows you the tool ID. It shows you the version, the input data sets, the parameters. Um, so I think this is a big step forward. Uh, next slide. Um, and then in the same way, you know, these, these workflows, they have a lot of metadata, they have a lot of information. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Galaxy has the concept of pages. Uh, so if you're a long time Galaxy user, you know, you can, you can create pages to describe your analysis. And a good starting point for this is actually workflows because, you know, you already have your inputs, you already describe what your workflow is doing. So you can automatically uh, create a uh, template for your workflow. This is now Markdown. So it's easy to write. It's easy to publish. Um, you can include um, all of the Galaxy visualizations. You can include previews of data sets. Um, so this is really great for disseminating your work, like really show what you've done. Um, like there's nothing to hide. Here are all the inputs. This is kind of a mini paper. It can maybe be the start to your actual paper. Um, next slide. Um, and then another thing is that we've, we've also collaborated with different consortia um, and we're going to hear about the collaboration with the Beacon project. And so one thing was that we produced uh, a huge amount of um, variant calling data sets that are very interesting because they've been processed uniformly and they are freely available, which is something that is not so common. It might be a unique resource. Um, but it is really something um, that not many people have produced and that is very uh, useful to, to such projects. So you wanna export this um, and we have the history export uh, and that has seen improvements over uh, several uh, of the releases. And so now one thing um, that we have, or it, it used to work fine, except it would time out. Um, so you would click on the history export of a large history and Galaxy would do its thing, but then after five minutes or whatever the timeout that was configured was, you would see, well, the request didn't complete. It would continue doing its thing, and then when it was ready, it was ready. But now um, we really poll, we, we check, okay, is this history export complete? And then um, you can also see your previous exports. Uh, if you already did an export, you don't need to re-export again. And then very importantly, uh, we have a new infrastructure for uh, pluggable um, file resources. So this can be for importing uh, things instead of uploading them. You can now get them from different sources um, like FTP, Dropbox, S3, WebDAV. And this is entirely uh, extendable and uses um, the PyFile System uh, 2 library. So you just need to write a small PyFile System 2 plugin and you can use your own data source. And this is also configurable per user. So users can bring their own Dropbox account. Of course, it, it's not a good idea to have just one Dropbox account for Galaxy. It's much more interesting if the user can bring their own. 
Um, and then, yeah, you can export your entire history to these uh, plugins. So these are both read and write. Um, next slide. So there are um, more webinars coming up on advanced features. I briefly touched on um, the Galaxy Workflow features. Uh, we will go into more details on the 3rd of March. I believe that's with uh, Sam, uh, I Sam Gurler. Um, <clears throat> then we'll have another uh, series, uh, another webinar on processing thousands of data sets uh, simultaneously, um, bridging two worlds and speed up your data analysis with Galaxy you know, the hidden features that few people know about, but that are incredibly useful. Um, so this is uh, always on Wednesday. Um, you can find the dates here. Um, next slide. Um, we have also introduced during the last year, the paper cut day, uh, which is a day that is dedicated um, to fixing small but annoying bugs. So these, these are the paper cuts, you know, you cut yourself on a paper, it's, it's not a big deal, but like, it is incredibly annoying. Um, and so this is uh, the, the Paper Cuts event. It starts, um, you know, um, it's a global event. So it starts in Australia, then um, moves towards Europe, and then the US joins in. So it's really a, well, more than 24 hour day, uh, hour project um, where we have regular meetups and, um, you know, we help, we, we try to help um, everyone that, that wants to work with us um, to fix something, to, to change something that they find really annoying. Um, so these are the, the paper cuts. Um, and this year we're going to have prizes. <laughs> paper cuts. Yep. So this, this should be a fun event. Like if you're interested in Galaxy and you, you know a few things about programming, uh, then join one of these events. We always have like uh, issues labeled that are easy or relatively easy to address that can maybe be done within a day. And you get, you know, the, all the Galaxy developers are present and are around and, um, you know, can help you out. Um, and then one last thing, tomorrow we will have a developer roundtable. That is, again, a new thing we introduced um, last year. They are always uh, every second Tuesday, Thursday. They moved. They were on Tuesday, now they're on Thursday. Um, so tomorrow is the next one. Um, and I'll be talking about uh, fast API. So this is a new um, framework that we're going to use for the Galaxy API. It's really making use of um, advanced Python features, uh, the type system, um, open API. Um, and it will allow us to do many, many, many cool things. Um, and if you're interested in that, please come join us. Perhaps I can expand on this. Um, so, uh, paper cuts, uh, developer roundtables. These are some of the new things that started happening um, last year. There's also something that we're trying. We just started this idea is that we are separating various types of Galaxy development tasks into uh, so-called working groups. So basically we divide developers who work on the project into these, well, we don't divide them, they divide themselves into these working groups and the working groups work on various aspects. For example, administration of the Galaxy instances, uh, development of the backend, or front end uh, user interface, deployment strategies, user support, and outreach. And the way this is, this is going to work is um, every working group establish a set of goals for quarter. So in the year we have quarters and then there are deliverables uh, that they achieve uh, by the end of, of each um, quarter cycle. Uh, and we're doing this for the first time. And in general, our idea is to change how the global Galaxy project is governed. So this is just a part of this new initiative uh, and we'll have more news on how, for example, this working group structure integrates with the community at large, how we make sure that our grand goals are satisfied, but at the, end, but at the same time, we can develop things that community wants. So all these aspects of um, globalized galaxy.
And um, I think what I want to say at the end is that Galaxy is globalized. Unfortunately, its funding is not yet. Uh, you know, funding re remains uh, uh, country specific. And uh, in different Galaxy instances, they rely on different sources of funding. Here in the US, we're lucky to have support from NIH, NSF, and in particular from two NIH institutes, the NHGRI, National, uh, Human Geno uh, National Human Genome Research Institute, and National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Uh, and it's similar structure in, in Germany and Australia. Uh, I don't know if um, anyone from associated with EU or uh, EU wants to talk about this, just, just let me know somehow. Um, and um, what I want to, what I want to flip in the end is, so this webinar was an introduction. We discussed two things. We discussed challenges from the standpoint of SARS-CoV-2 data generation in general, and how these challenges highlighted galaxy deficiencies and how we're planning to address them. It's a kind of a funny and sad thing that SARS-CoV-2 is sort of a very good thing for software development because it um, pushed a data analysis in biology. It's a small genome, but there are very, very many data sets that you can generate. So it's uh, it's a challenge, and it's a challenge not only for Galaxy, it's a challenge for, uh, for example, portals such as um, NCBI, such as SR8 and CBI and um, EBI here uh, in, in Europe. Um, and on that note, uh, we'll just open the um, floor for questions.